<laughs> Matthew 19, beginning verse 16. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I want you to notice one of the comments this rich young ruler said to Jesus, and here it is. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Truth of the matter is, there is no one good thing that you can do to inherit eternal life. This man was a wealthy young man. He was set on religious matters. He wanted to learn more about religion. And you could say he was a perfect candidate to be a disciple or a follower of Christ. In fact, by reading the scripture, you know he was educated in the things of God. But he knew he was missing something in his life. He just couldn't put his finger on it. You know, sometimes we have things in life that is just not there and we're not sure what's going on. Well, that's where this young man was at. He knew he was missing something. So I want you to picture for a moment how the story is unfolding. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He knows what awaits him there. This is about the time of the crucifixion. And there's a young man seen running towards Jesus, and he kneels down in front of him. And I think as Jesus looks at him, he saw in this young man a lot of promise, a lot of potential in him. And I must say that I like that about Jesus. He sees in his things that no one else sees. We see people's faults. He sees their promise. We see people's rough exterior. He sees their potential. Jesus sees beyond our faults. Jesus sees beyond our attitudes. And pardon this one, Jesus even sees beyond our masks. One person said he saw the best in me when everyone else around could only see the worst in me. Some tend to size people up. Some of us, we, we tend to look at somebody and say, is that really the best person that we should witness to? And if you're thinking that you're not one of those people, that's good, but I have seen that. We want to make sure that that individual is going to be a good fit in the church. That they're going to be a good fit in the crowd that we hang with. I pray that we allow the Holy Spirit to show us people's potential rather than their faults. We've got to remember that Jesus taught, man looks at the outward, 
Yet God looks at the heart. This story is found in the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And as you read each account in those different books, you will find some slightly different things because each individual looked at the situation in a little different manner. But I find it interesting as I was listening to the conversation between Jesus and the rich young ruler. This young man starts out with, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? And Jesus replied, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that's God. There are many people that think that all you have to do is be a good person, and you're going to go to heaven. They fail to see or just don't know the scripture that says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Now, I want you to get this now. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works. Get that part. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. An older gentleman, a good friend of mine, some years back, was in my office and we were talking about things. And in the course of our conversation, he said, Craig, <clears throat> I will do anything for you. And I replied at some point in the conversation, what do you mean by that? His response was, what part don't you understand? Now fast forward to some years later. This man was in my office again. His health was failing him. And I asked him, have you ever asked Jesus to come into your heart? He says, I thought all you had to do was to do good things. This was an honest conversation between the two of us. I thought all you had to do was to do good things. I shared with him that scripture out of Ephesians. He says, you mean to tell me? And I had to chuckle after he said this. I didn't have to do all those good things. <laughs> and he left that day. He didn't make a commitment to the Lord at that time. But just a couple weeks later, I got a call that he had passed away. And his daughter had led him to the Lord before he did but so many people think that's all you need to do is good things. All you need to do is to be good. Now, back to the conversation. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. The rich young man said, which ones? And as I was listening to that conversation going back and forth, I wanted to jump in there and answer that for Jesus and say, what part of that question didn't you understand? But Jesus wouldn't do it that way, so he laid it out for this young man, and here it is. We read it just moments ago. <clears throat> you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Do not to bear false witness. You shall honor your father and your mother. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And I think most of us could say, as this man did, I have kept these things from my youth. I know some of us are going to say, well, we slipped on this one or we slipped on that one. And, but do I get, do, dare go there with, you shall love your neighbor? 
as yourself? Can we all handle that one? You know, to me, I think that could be one of the toughest ones. Anyone agree with me on that? And I know some of you are thinking about that, that that one could be hard. Of course, some have problems with other ones in here. It can be hard, especially when, no, I'm not gonna go there, I'm gonna leave that blank. And I'm gonna let you fill in those blanks there. But you know what I mean. And the young man said, all of these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Again, he knew something was missing in his life. <clears throat> and Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then, I want you to come follow me. And when the young man heard that, he went away sorrowful. Here's how Jesus responded to his disciples. You see, his disciples couldn't figure Jesus out when he responded this way. In fact, they kind of put it to him and say, you know, Lord, how is anyone ever going to get saved? in our common words. Here's how Jesus responded to them. Verse 23 and 24, Assuredly I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So, why would Jesus say something like this? I want to ask you this question. How much wealth qualifies you to be wealthy? So let me give you a little perspective. If you have food in your refrigerator, clothes on your back, a roof over your head, and a place to sleep, you are richer than 75% of the population in this world. So flip that. You are among the 25% wealthiest in the world. Let me take it a step further. If you have Money in the bank. Cast in your tank. <laughs> Money in your wallet. Some change in your pocket. Didn't see any hands going down. I was feeling down here. No. Uh -huh. Some change in your pocket. You are among the world's top 8% of the world's wealthy. Now, if that helps bring this whole thing into perspective, and with that thought in mind, I want to share with you the, the parable of the talents. It's a very popular parable. It's found in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. We're not going to read it. But a master was getting ready to go on a journey. He called his servants together and entrusted with them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another he gave two, and to another one he gave one talent. And the Bible says to each according to his ability. And I want that part to sink in also. To each according to his ability. And then he went away. The one that received five talents made five more. Also, the one that received two talents received or made five two more. 
But the one who received one talent went and dug a hole in the ground and hid the money. After a long time, the master returns. Servant who was given the five presented that and the five more to his master. He was told, well done, you have been faithful. Over a little, I will set you over much. And to the one given two talents and had earned two more, Master said, well done, you have been faithful, I will set you over much. To the servant who had been given one, he said, or the, the servant said, I, I was afraid. So I hit your talents. Here is what you gave me. The master said, take what he has, give it to the one who has ten, and cast him into the darkness. Now, as with this example, along with the rich young ruler, it's not so much that he was wealthy, it's what he wouldn't or felt he couldn't do with his wealth. Jesus said, go sell and give to the poor. Now just for a matter of perspective here also, when I read something like this, I want to know how much a talent was worth. Anyone ever think of that? The talent in those days, and there's a wide discrepancy between how scholars believe, but a talent in those days was worth between $400,000 and $800,000 in today's money. So he was entrusting his servants with a lot of money. A lot of wealth. This rich young ruler, he didn't want to part with any of his. As with anyone, the rich young ruler, the servants with the talents, you and I, to whom much is given, much is required. It's obvious that money was this rich young ruler's God. Riches make it more difficult to follow Christ because it's so hard for people to give it up. But we must choose to put God first in our lives. Our story mentioned it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You sell, you hear that, you're going, that's impossible. There's no way. And it sounds like it's impossible them to enter into God's kingdom. Especially, as I explained with the illustrations, that from a world view, all of us in this room are wealthy. <clears throat> all of us, I'm sure, don't feel like we're wealthy. But we are wealthy in comparison to the rest of the world. Jesus resolves that issue in Matthew 19, verse 26, by telling us this. With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. And I want you to stop and think just for a moment this morning. With man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And I want you to ask yourself, what in your life is going on in your life 
that just seems impossible for you to get through. It seems impossible that you're never going to get over that mountain that you're trying to go over. You're never going to get through that tough situation because it seems so impossible. And then I want you to go back to the scripture, Matthew chapter 19. With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So there are two takeaways from this message this morning. Rich young ruler said, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus, not in these words, is saying, make me the Lord of your life. My interpretation is, and what most people here in church is, ask Jesus to come into your heart and make him the Lord of your life. I'd like you to consider that this morning. If you've never done that, just as the man that had sat in my office, thinking that all he had to do was good things, what we need to do is ask Jesus to come into our hearts and make him the Lord of your life. And the second takeaway is this Are you willing? To give your talents to God. <clears throat> Not by doing good works, but whatever God wants you to do. You see, if you do something with your talents, God is going to give back to you. But as the one with one talent that did absolutely nothing with it, it ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. So I want you to consider those two things. I'd like you to bow your heads with me this morning. And I want to ask you this morning, if you're one of those that, for the, for the first takeaway that I shared, maybe you have never asked Jesus to come into your heart. If you want to do that this morning, I'd like you to lift up your hand. You see that? Yeah, you see that? You see that? And then the others. Especially where it says, if you have something that seems impossible in your life, and you need God's help, I want to see those hands also. Heavenly Father, right now. Right now, Lord, I love you so much. God, you're an awesome God. Father, first I pray that you do a work in each life that needs you, that is signified by saying, by lifting up their hands. They need you. They have impossible things in their life. They need you. They want you. Those hands that were ready 